Hello and welcome back to Hilbert Spaces, the video series where we talk a lot about infinite dimensional inner product spaces. And in today's part 14, we will prove the important theorem from the last video, which also included Parseval's identity. More precisely, the statement was that for a given orthonormal system, Parseval's identity is equivalent to that this orthonormal system is total. And exactly this we will show for any inner product space, so no completeness is required here. However, before we go into the calculations, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget that with a Steady membership you can download a lot of additional material for all the videos. Just check out the link in the description to download PDF versions and quizzes for the videos. Ok, then without further ado, let's recall the statement from the last video, where we have an inner product space X and an orthonormal system E alpha. And then what we get are four claims which are all equivalent. The first one is just saying that we have a total O and S, so actually an O and B. Then the second one is Pass's identity, which is simply Bessel's inequality with inequality. And then the third one tells us that every vector x in x can be expanded in the following way with respect to the O and S. This looks like a common linear combination, but the scalar here is moved to the right of the vector to make a nicer formula. However, please be careful, in an infinite dimensional inner product space, this is not a linear combination, because we have an infinite sum here. Hence, in that case, it's actually a limit process inside our inner product space X. In fact, if you just look at a finite dimensional case, nothing here is really complicated and something we have already discussed in linear algebra. Therefore, in this video, we just have to consider the infinite dimensional cases. And now finally, part 4 says that the inner product can also be represented by such an infinite sum. And what we want to prove is that all these claims are equivalent, which means if you know one, you know all the other ones as well. So it's a really important theorem, because it says with an O and B, we can do all these things in calculations. And now for the proof, this means that we have to combine some implications. So maybe let's start with the most important one, namely that an O and B implies Parseval's identity. So please note, what we assume now is that our given O and S is total. So by definition this means that the set of all possible linear combinations we can form with the set is dense in X. More precisely, this notion dense simply means that for any point X in X and any epsilon ball around it, you always find an element in the span that lies inside the epsilon ball. In other words, you can be as close as you want with the span to the given point X. And obviously this property is needed if we want to talk about the limit process given in part 3. However, before we do that, let's first do the calculation to get Parseval's identity. For that, let's fix our X in the inner product space and also the epsilon greater than 0. Both things are arbitrarily chosen, so the proof is still completely general. And for the next step, please recall from the last video that it does not matter how large the infinity of the index set i actually is. The essential contribution to Parseval's identity is always given by a countable set. It could also be a finite set, but maybe let's stick with the countable infinity. Hence what we have to do here is to choose an enumeration such that we have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 and so on. So this is a countable subset of our index set i with a bijection to the natural numbers in mind. And you might already see that everything gets much simpler with that, because now we can describe the denseness of the span with this enumeration. So we just take the first n members and some corresponding scalars to form a linear combination. And exactly the denseness now guarantees that we can always find an n such that we lie inside the epsilon ball. Or more precisely, the distance between x and the linear combination is less than epsilon. And now in order to get something that actually helps us for Parseval's identity, we need to square both sides. Because then we definitely get something that has the norm of x squared. And maybe to make the whole calculation a little bit shorter, 
let's call the linear combination y. So what we have is that epsilon squared is greater than x minus y in the norm squared. And of course, squaring means that we can use the inner product as usual. This is always helpful because it means we can separate it into the three terms and the first one is the norm of x squared. And the two middle parts are almost the same, namely the inner product of x with y. And indeed the other one we can say is the complex conjugate of that. And finally the last one would be the norm of y squared, but we also write it with an inner product again. So you see the first part is already what we want for Parseval's identity and the other ones we have to simplify. For example, the two middle parts can be written as minus two times the real part of inner product x with y. And moreover, in the last term, we can just put in the formula for the linear combination. And to make everything clear, we write the first sum with an index j and the second sum with an index k. And then obviously we would use the linearity in the second argument to pull out sums and scalars. So the whole equation already looks much simpler and also here in the middle term we can substitute y. And then in the third term here we actually have a double sum with index j and k. And indeed the first scalar inside the sum has a complex conjugation on it. And then as you can see as always what remains in the inner product is just the ONS and there we can just use the Kronecker delta. In other words, the double sum will collapse to a single sum. So let's summarize what we still have here. We still have the norm of x squared. And then we can pull out the sum symbol and inside we have the real part of lambda j times the inner product x with e alpha j. And as already mentioned, the double sum on the right is now just a single sum. And this one has lambda j in the absolute value squared. Hence, we can simplify the whole equation and just use one sum symbol by putting these two terms together. And maybe we also put the last term here to the front, such that we have a plus sign now. And then the minus sign comes afterwards as minus two times the real part of this. So maybe this looks a little bit complicated, but please don't forget what we actually want to have is just x and this inner product x with the O and S. This means the lambda factors here are not so important for us, we actually want to get rid of them. In order to do that, it might be helpful to look at some calculation rules we have for complex numbers. In particular, we need to know how the binomial expansion looks for the absolute value when we have the difference of two complex numbers inside. This is not a mystery at all because we know the complex conjugation is involved. So we have the complex conjugate of a minus b times a minus b. In other words, this is just a special version of the calculation we have done on the right. In particular, the middle part we can just write as minus two times the real part of the product. Hence, we could definitely use this formula to simplify everything here in the parentheses. Hence, lambda j would be the complex number a and this inner product here would be the complex conjugate of b. And there you see, the only thing missing would be the absolute value of b squared. This means that it would be smart to artificially add it and subtract it again. And this allows us to write the first part just as an absolute value squared. So more precisely, here we have the sum of the absolute value and inside we have lambda j minus b, which is the inner product of e alpha j with x. And then we just have to square the absolute value. And then what we have subtracted here, the absolute value of b squared, is actually what we want to have in Parseval's identity. In conclusion, the whole part here in front we don't need at all, and this one is definitely non-negative. So what we get is an inequality, which is almost Parseval's identity. Please note, Parseval's identity would say that the difference between these two terms would be equal to zero, but now we only know it's less than epsilon squared. So maybe let's summarize what we have. The norm of x squared is bounded by epsilon squared plus this sum. Or to say it more precisely, for any given epsilon, we find an index n such that this inequality holds. Hence, we can make our epsilon as small as we want and then we get a statement for the limit n to infinity. 
namely the limit can definitely not be smaller than a norm of x squared. And this one is quite interesting because it's the opposite direction as we have it from Bessel's inequality. Indeed, Bessel's inequality claims that this limit has to be less or equal than the norm of x squared. Hence, we actually have the equality, so Parseval's identity is shown. So we are done with showing the first implication and this might have been already the hardest one. So let's start with the next one, where we go from the second statement to the third statement. Which means now we assume Parseval's identity and want to show the existence of the limit. Therefore we don't have to change the start of the proof much, because we can still fix a given vector x in x and choose a proper enumeration of our indices. And then we can also define the finite linear combination yn where we want to calculate the limit of. So as always what we have are the vectors e alpha j scaled with these inner products. Okay, and then as you might already expect, we will calculate the difference between x and yn. And obviously we can just copy the calculation from before because we have exactly the same combination here, just that our coefficients lambda j are now fixed. Which means in the real part we have these two inner products multiplied and the last term is just a sum over the absolute value squared. So it's just a standard calculation and we immediately recognize that here we also just have the absolute value squared. Therefore taking the real part does not change anything and we can combine these two terms. And then not so surprising, what remains here is exactly what we know from Parseval's identity. More concretely, if we send n to infinity, we get out 0. So the conclusion of that is that yn converges to the vector x with respect to the norm in x. So the sequence yn is convergent and we always get out the same limit x. In particular, our limit does not change at all if we choose a different enumeration here. So you see, we get out exactly the statement in our third claim. Any x can be written as this infinite sum. Okay, then finally, to close the circle between 1, 2 and 3, we can go from 3 to 1. Hence, here we assume that any x in x can be written as this limit. And now we already know, this simply means that for any given epsilon, we can find an index lowercase n, such that this norm is less than epsilon. So not complicated at all, it just means that we can approximate our x as well as we want. However, obviously this is a linear combination consisting of our elements from the ONS. So if we call these coefficients lambda j, you immediately recognize that we have a total ONS. So exactly the statement from point 1. And now you should see, the only thing missing in the whole proof is just the connection to the statement 4. In fact, the one implication is really easy. If we assume 4, we immediately see 2. This means if we have the formula with the inner product, we directly get out Parseval's identity again. And we see that by taking the special case y is equal to x. Then the left hand side is just the norm of x squared and in the right hand side we have the absolute value squared. So indeed this is Parseval's identity as we already know it. Hence the last puzzle piece for the whole proof is now going from 3 to 4. So again we just assume that every vector in x can be written as the limit of such a linear combination. And now since we want to calculate the inner product, we have to look at two vectors. And now as always we go to our countable set and now we have two of them. This does not change much because the union is still a countable set and we can choose an enumeration again. And that's all we need to calculate the inner product y with x. Indeed we can just replace y and x with the limits respectively. Hence for y we can write our combination as always, where we send m to infinity. And in the same way for x, where we just send n to infinity. And now we can first pull out the limits here, because we already know that the inner product is continuous in each component. 
In fact, this is not hard to show, it immediately follows from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And with that I would say the next step in the calculation are quite clear, because we can just use the linearity in the second argument and the conjugate linearity in the first argument. And then, as in a lot of other calculations, we see that the double sum collapses. It's the same thing as always, what remains in the inner product is just our own s, and this gives us the Konecka delta kj. And therefore, instead of two limits, we just have one limit and almost our result. Indeed, we just have to rearrange our inner product, and then we are done. So what we have here is the O and B in the middle of the inner product, and it does not change the inner product at all. So that's what we wanted to show, and with that, the whole proof is finished. So all together, with that proof, now you know that all these four statements are equivalent and are known as Parseval's identity. Hence, having an O and B is needed if you want to do all these nice calculation rules. Okay, and what we can actually do with that, I will show you in some future videos. So really hope I meet you there again, and have a nice day, bye bye. Mm -hmm.